you know, Nick Wayne got to uh, make a cameo there in the main event, which was uh, most entertaining because, you know, they had they had seats for Nick and 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 Shauna, Nick's mom, and uh, but what they don't want is an empty seat, and so basically Nick and Shauna had to sit in those front row seats for the entire show. Yeah, well, it sounds awesome, right? Shauna's mortified. <laughs> She's trying so hard to get out of this gig. Yeah. I don't even know if she actually sat there or if she got somebody else to be a, a stand-in for her. But, uh, yeah, they uh, they got front row seats, and they did that angle with Joe. And we did the talk as Jericho. And my favorite story I want to start with here, my favorite story, because I didn't even know this until yesterday. Remember, I, was it this show that I told the uh, – or I think it was with Dave. Where I told the story about how one day Buddy called and uh, – he wanted me to go out to his school and and uh, show the guy some stuff. And he talked me up real big. And I should have said no. Because I went out there and I was fucking the boss. I was Nigel McGinnis on his first week. Mm. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do any spots. I couldn't remember how to do anything. It was so fucking... I was just like... That was when I knew I was done forever till. Tom ended up dragging me back, but it was so, it was just, I was just pathetic, horrible. I was a sad, broken, pathetic ex wrestler who couldn't do a goddamn fucking thing. And, uh, you know who was there that night? Uh, are you going to tell me it was Darby Allen? Yeah, it was Darby. Yeah. That's his only experience with you being in the ring. That's what I thought. But yeah. you know what? I learned otherwise yesterday. Oh. Because we're doing the uh, talk is Jericho. And in the end, he asked Nick about, Nick's memories of Buddy wrestling. And Buddy, of course, passed away when Nick was 11. Mm -hmm. So he didn't have a lot of memories, obviously, of Buddy wrestling because he wasn't born for most of the stuff that uh, that Buddy did. So uh, what he mentions as a memory of Buddy wrestling is that show that they ran in Portland in 2014 where that one bloke decided he was going to become a promoter and he rented out the Portland Civic Arena or something, this giant fucking building. And uh, Buddy had called me to work that show with him. And my last match had been 2010 with Christopher Rizek. We did a loser leaves town for 30 days, and I left for the rest of my life. I abided by the stipulation. You did. So I had not wrestled for four years. Buddy calls. He asked me to do this show. And so I said, sure, I'll, uh, I'll do it. And so I trained the best I could, and I went out there, and I showed up, and it was every match we ever had. What do you want to do? Eh. We'll call it out there. And then we went out, and we did the match. And uh, and I learned yesterday, you'll never guess, Vinny, mm -hmm. even though you will, who had been in the business for one week and the first job they ever had in wrestling, the first thing they ever did in wrestling was ringing the opening bell for Brian Alvarez versus Buddy Wayne. Uh, Buddy Rose. It was Darby Allen. How about that? He rang the bell for that match. I never knew that before. And so it was a very special day yesterday because... You know, I heard the story, and it was it was cool. But what was really cool about it was we watched that Rampage promo where he talked about how when he graduated high school at 120 pounds, everybody told him, you will never be a wrestler, including he noted his father and how he believed them for several years, and he didn't feel whole. And then he finally decided that he was going to do this. And when he decided he was going to do this, he went to Buddy Wayne. And a week later, he was ringing the bell for our match. But the fact of the matter is, we listened to that promo. And seven years later or whatever, that kid ringing that bell in Portland, Oregon, was in the fucking main event of the AEW West Coast debut in Seattle winning the TNT title from Samoa Joe and getting the fucking biggest pop and the confetti and the people screaming and...
That was the most awesome ending to a fucking show. And at the end of the day, he proved everybody wrong. Correct. He proved that he could be a pro wrestler. And by the way, not only did he prove he could be a fucking pro wrestler, he proved that he could be a pro wrestler on a national fucking television yeah. show, sign to the second biggest organization in the world, and win the fucking TNT title from Samoa Joe in the main event of that show in the biggest fucking match. So, congratulations to Darby Allen. Yeah. Fucking great. It's a big deal. I was so happy when that show was over. Oh, this is the best. Well, we'll get into this here, I guess, right now. But you know, we do have positive things to say about this here main event of Darby Allen challenging Samoa Joe for the TNT title. So, huge ovation for Darby, who is, of course, nuts. And Samoa Joe is a big, scary monster. And uh, Darby knows that he needs an advantage on Joe. So he attacks him before the bell. Lays him out, throws him uh, off the stage originally, and then brings out an enormous ladder. And uh, I believe this sent on was a tribute to that match where he rang the bell for me and Buddy Wayne mm -hmm. when I did that. Sen hey, by the way, you know who put over that sent on? Tell me who put over the sent on. Fucking Raw GM Adam Pierce. Well, how about that? Yeah, he was at that show. Oh. He goes, man, what a sent on, Alvarez. Yeah, you can do a sent on. Yeah, you can do a sentence. Uh, this sentence was much higher than. Uh... Never called me. Sorry. I know. Oh. Asking my advice about what to do with Raw or anything. There's still time, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Darby did not do a sentence in the ring onto the mat. He just sent on off a very tall ladder onto Samoa Joe's very broad back, and then uh, landed on his feet in the entrance ramp. But I don't know what this looked like on TV, but in person, that ladder looked about forty feet high. <laughs> just he, he fell. Hi, because Darby Allen is nuts. God, I, I was scared shitless because they set the ladder up, and uh, and there there's there's the ramp, and then Joe is off the ramp. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so I yeah. thought Darby was going to go off the thing off the ramp. That was seriously. Which, if that been... was the case, the ladder should be should be this way, right? Right. But the ladder's this way, so I thought, oh no, 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 no. But then Joe gets on the ramp, and I start feeling a little better. And then I see two referees go up, and they're they're holding the ladder for yeah. Darby. Yeah. So I'm like, okay. Under the guise of saying, no, Darby, don't. But, yeah. they were fact but the point is, yeah. the ladder's facing the right way. Yeah, yeah. Joe's in the right spot. And there's two men holding the ladder. All right, fine. So he starts climbing up this fucking ladder. And I don't know why, but he got to the top. And all of a sudden, the ladder starts going like this. I'm like, hold it! What are you two doing? And then it got steadied. And then he pulled it off. I was fucking scared, but not as scared as I was about five seconds later. Uh, I've actually, I, it, is this when Joe started to kill him? It's when he took that fucking Yurnage and the steel. Oh, step. God, that, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, because the last time we saw uh, Joe versus Dar Darby, it was basically Joe killing him for nine minutes, and they had to finish for one minute, and Joe, once he got the advantage, picked up right where he left off, including the Yurinagi onto the stairs on the outside, and, uh, not really a great way to take this, but uh, from what I could see, it took, like, the worst possible way, like the edge of the stairs right in the ed, uh, middle of his spine, that was terrifying. He did the big cartwheel bump off the post of the floor. So essentially, for, again, about 10 minutes, it was Joe murdering Darby Allen, taking his time with it, having a fun, grand old time. And uh, I'm not sure Darby got any offense until the very finish, but the finish was a... a, a uh, a turnbuckle pad was loosened. If I'm not sure it was loosened, I think it just came off with brute force. But Joe's got the sleeper on uh, uh, Darby or something. Maybe it's just, he's in the corner. Joe's in the corner, and Darby pulls him out. And Joe yanks off the turnbuckle pad, and he throws that turnbuckle pad 40 feet in the air like that ladder. Everyone can see this turnbuckle was exposed now. And so Joe's going for the sleeper. And uh, the, 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 the choke, I should say, because Darby got a sleeper, but Joe did the big show Mick Foley WrestleMania bump, which just splats right on him because Darby's nuts. And so Joe goes for the choke. He's going to choke Darby out, but Darby fights to his feet and runs in the corner and ducks, and so Joe goes face first in the exposed buckle. And uh, that was pretty much it because Darby did a code red. He did a coffin drop to the back. He did a coffin drop to the uh, front, and he pinned him. And we were talking about this, how, like, going into the show, it seemed like there was only one possible finish, which is that Darby wins this title here in his hometown of Seattle and sends a crowd home happy. 
uh, as the show went on, it was and it was going on last and everything. It was blatantly obvious that's the only thing you could possibly do here. But I don't think the crowd expected it. And when they, and, and listen, while I'm walking around, uh, I see looking at T-shirts and people dressed up as wrestlers and whatnot. The two most popular people I saw based on that metric of who had the most signs and the most uh, imitators: Eddie Kingston and Darby Allen. These people love them some Darby. But I don't think they thought he was going to win this TNT title, even though they'd already had it before. I'm not sure why they thought it would be such a such a surprise, but they were surprised. And he goes up and hits that second coffin drop, and he makes that cover. And that counts one and two and three. The only thing I can compare this to is I was in Anaheim for the UFC show when Cain Velasquez beat Brock Lesnar. Everyone goes crazy. I'm looking around. Adults are jumping up and down with joy. They have seen their hometown hero triumph over the big scary monster. Like, pro wrestling is magical. It is just magical. No, you know what it Earth fucking Christ. is? Tell me. It's easy. It should be, or at least simple. Like, if you just do the right things, it's fucking easy. And you know what the right thing is? Darby Allen win this fucking title from this monster. You know what this match reminded me of? Tell me. I don't know why. I mean, I kind of know why, but. Vader and Ric Flair. Yeah. At Starcade. Yeah, yeah. Because it was in Flair's hometown. He was small. Vader was big. This is all checking out, yeah. Vader beat the holy living motherfuck out of him. And there was something about the finish. Obviously, Ric Flair did not do two uh, uh, sentons. I think it was like a cradle. But the visual of the finish, like, Vader's so big, and Ric Flair is so much smaller than him. The the finish is almost it's almost kind of preposterous. And it was kind of like that with, with Darby too, because he hit the first coffin drop, he hits the second coffin drop, and even as he's covering Joe, it's like he's so small compared to this guy, but he got him. Which is the same thing you thought in the Ric Flair match. Like he got him. Yeah. And and it was the happy ending oh. in the hometown. And you know, in the Flair match, it's his family. In the Darby match, there's Nick and Shauna. And that's what it reminded me of, was that that match with Ric Flair and Vader, which was a fucking amazing match, an amazing moment in WCW history. And this was an amazing match and an amazing moment mm-hmm. in, uh, in AEW history. So it couldn't, I mean, literally, it could not have gone better. It absolutely could not have gone better. That and, uh, and really, like a lot of this show, I mean, I mean, three, some of it could have gone better. Three quarters of the show could hardly have gone any better. Yes, three quarters of the show could not have gone better. Yeah, the, that, the the stuff that could have gone better, ironically, actually could have gotten a fucking lot better. Yeah, but that, that, everything else couldn't have gotten better. That a uh, third quarter of the show was yeah. subpar to say the least. But uh, and then the show ends, and then but then Darby does the post match promo thanking Seattle, talking about what it means, bringing Nick into the ring. God, Nick is such a fucking worker already. He's incredible. <laughs> Like, fuck, Darby goes, Nick Wayne, get in here. And Nick looks at, he's looking at the people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, like, he's like John Cena going to get a tag. Yeah. And he jumps over the apron, and they're all cheering, and God, he was so fucking good. Yeah. Dude, I don't want to give away everything from the Jericho podcast, but this is actually something you wouldn't even know anyway, because it's a, it's a, you know, audio podcast, but not video. But, you know, Jericho and I are... Older, mm, yeah, yeah, seasoned, yeah. silver foxes, even though we're both not. But anyway, we've been around the, the block, and Nick is sitting here talking about all of this stuff that he has done, and all of these people that he has wrestled, and just, Jericho and I are just looking at each other like, what the fuck? What? He's talking about, oh, you know, a couple of weeks ago I, I wrestled Bandito, yeah. and then, you know, Swerve Strickland, and then Christopher Daniels. It's like all of these, all these fucking great workers, and then he's been he's toured Japan, yeah, yeah. and you know, Jericho's like, "What did you first tour Japan?" And Nick's like, "I was I was sixteen, and of course Jericho was nineteen. That's a three year difference." Yeah. He's like. God. But anyway, this Nick is 17 and what a worker. Everything, not just like, you know, doing moves and everything like that, but 
just watching this guy. It's on the the AEW social media. Yes, yeah, so I'm they shared this. It's but go great. fucking find this because yeah. watching that guy look around and then he jumps the rail and then he gets in the ring and God, he was just on the whole time. It was incredible. Yeah, he's gonna do fine. He's gonna do fine. He's gonna do all right. That Nick Wayne. You heard it here first. Yeah. You actually, you know, when you first heard it. The Battle of the ago. Empire. Yeah. Battle of the Empire in 2005 when I held that youngster in my hands and Ed Moretti was in the background of the picture going, hey. Remember that picture? A little bit. I got it. Yeah. That's when I knew this kid would be something. But did you know that in January, WWE presents the Royal Rumble on the show will be what is being called a pitch black match. Why, you ask? Well, Mountain Dew apparently has a drink. Called Mountain Dew Pitch Black. And they got a lot of money. If it's all blacked out and nothing happens, we're actually the winners because, you know, we don't have to actually watch it. Jared, put a black thing on the screen here. It's It would be like if the match was like this for 10 minutes, and all you heard was, oh, ow, boom. Oh. No, Mike, stop it. If you enjoy these videos for just $7.99 per month, you can enjoy full-length editions of The Brian and Vinny Show, Wrestling Observer Live, Figure Four Daily with Tom Lawler and Lance Storm, The Mad Men Podcast, Speak Now Pro Wrestling with Denise Salcedo and more, plus hundreds of archived shows, all in beautiful HD. Don't miss out. Join us today.